This is James Tripp. This is uh, a live stream. I'm going to hope this is going to work out because I'm going to walk and talk while I do this. I'll be on my uh, on my SIM card that I got out here. So I'm walking down Santa Monica uh, Main Street. Came back off the beachfront because it was a little bit windy out there. So I'm hoping it's not going to be so bad here. I'm unpacking the Magus by John Foles and making sure I don't get run over here. Um, the Magus. Now, this is a really interesting novel. I'm unpacking this and it's going to be mainly of interest to, I suspect, hypnotists and NLPers, possibly especially NLPers. Uh, but it's an interesting book that kind of, I don't know, kind of rattles the brain in a number of different ways. So I want to give you a little bit of a, a backstory and I want to share with you an interesting personal resonance around this. Uh, if you saw my video that I made, sort of debriefing my experience at HypnoThoughts this year, you'll remember me talking about the fact that I'd come from uh, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. And, excuse me, the bus is going by there. I'd come from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. I'd been kind of immersed in all of this performance, these great performers, people creating phenomenal and impactful shows. I'd been to one show in particular which really blew my mind, which was on the theatre maverick Ken Campbell. It was Terry Johnson's interrupted monologue, Ken. Now, I was talking at the time about uh, performance and how performance can really evoke, really shift people's perceptions and realities and how it was interesting to me, the idea of creating a performance that was kind of interactive but really shifted minds, almost like a way of, of rattling people's reality apart so it could get restructured through interactive performances. And I didn't really know where I was going with that. I talked to a lot of people at Hypno Thoughts about it, uh, but I was quite clear at the time, I don't quite know where that goes or, or what that's about. And this was right just before I started reading The Magus by John Foles. And the reason I pick the majors up is because I've been doing some research around the lyrics and the meaning of the lyrics to Hotel California by the Eagles because I love the lyrics to Hotel California they're really they're just kind of really trippy they're really they sort of there's something evocative about them I've always felt drawn in by them and sort of reality bending and in this article about the uh, Hotel California lyrics it mentioned they had a feel similar to the majors by John Foles now I thought the majors that sounds interesting uh, an alluring title. I'll read that because I'm reading a lot of fiction at the moment. I have a deep interest in narrative and narratives that move minds at the moment. So, I um, started reading The Magus and it was extremely interesting because I'm reading it. Now, The Magus, it's written by John Foles. It started out as a semi-autobiographical novel um, and it started out, I believe, when he first started writing it as an out and out supernatural kind of thriller, but it evolved into something else, something quite different, something quite strange and unusual. And it's basically the story of somebody that gets pulled into a mind-bending game that, that totally warps reality and breaks down uh, this person who gets pulled into the game. It breaks down their perceptions about what is or isn't so. And it reminded me in a lot of ways of the uh, Fincher film, David Fincher film, The Game. And I think the Fincher film, The Game, was probably inspired massively by The Magus. So if you haven't read The Magus, but you have seen The Game by, uh, by Fincher, and it has Michael Douglas in the lead role, you'll get that sense, that sense of what's real, what's not. The protagonist doesn't know. So this is the nature of the book. And it's the guy, it's about a guy who goes and uh, ends up teaching at a school on a Greek island and he meets uh, an enigmatic wealthy man there who has a little estate on the island or a big estate on the island and this is the major mentioned in the title I'm not going to give any details away I'm not going to give any spoilers away just in case anyone should wish to read this book so what was interesting to me about the major so first of all is there's that bizarre resonance this idea about performance shifting reality, rattling people's minds, performance as a change work intervention. Because one of the things that's not clear is this reality that gets this person gets pulled into, is it for his benefit? Is it for the players of the game's benefit? Is it a change work intervention? Is it a psychological intervention? These realities get woven into each other and it's not necessarily clear. But I've been thinking about hypnosis as it relates to performance. It's an interesting bit in the book, where suddenly the Magus, the, the character of the Magus, whose name is Conscious in the book, 
is revealed to be a hypnotist. And I thought, that's just too weird, he's a hypnotist. So then there's this other layer going on. Are things being staged by actors? Is it hypnosis that's creating these events? Whatever is occurring, it all starts to unhinge the mind. But I just found it fascinating that hypnosis was in the mix there, uh, in this kind of mind-bending mix. Because I'd been thinking about not only uh, how performance relates to hypnosis, but how hypnosis could be used within performance to create effects. So this is something I've been playing with. So it's just a, a complete head job for me that I should end up reading this book when it was so aligned with so many things that are occurring for me right now and unfolding for me. Uh, so, so that was a really interesting thing. Now, another interesting thing that I found, about three quarters of the way through the book, the protagonist in it, he finds a little note with a story written on it. And it is a story that is known to many people who are trained in NLP. And it's a story that's very familiar to me. And I didn't realize that this was the source of it, that it came from The Magus by John Foles. The story is the story of the prince and the magician. And it starts off, if I remember rightly, uh, something like this. It starts off, there once was a prince who believed in all things but three. He did not believe in princesses, he did not believe in islands, and he did not believe in God. So if you've trained in NLP, you may have been told this story by an NLP trainer. I know it's cropped up in a number of NLP books. Um, I believe it's in Joseph O'Connor and John Seymour's Teach Yourself NLP. I know Doug O'Brien's used it in his sleight of mouth stuff. And I believe it shows up in one of the early NLP books. I can't remember which one. My feeling is it might be reframing, but I could be wrong about that. Um, and, it's, and it's one beloved of many NLP trainers. So I was quite surprised to find it in this book. Now, here's the interesting thing. I have uh, a friend of mine who's worked very closely with John Grinder, who's trained with John Grinder. One of the things he told me about uh, being kind of personally mentored by John Grinder was that John had suggested to him, in fact, insisted that he watch The Game, which is the Fincher film I mentioned which I believe was hugely inspired by the Magus. Um, and my friend who was mentored by John Grindo did indeed watch the game and it became uh, a huge part of his thinking about how he approached change work interventions. Now, I, I don't know how much I'm supposed to say about this, but there are some people from some areas of NLP who are involved in some rather interesting and creative approaches to change work, which really do involve setting up states of affairs which are difficult to differentiate from reality. Uh, weather looks great. Hey, thank you. So I got a message in there. I didn't quite see who that was from because the sun's glaring in my eyes because the weather is great. Um, so this is a really interesting thing because the thing that's striking me as I read it is that there's a lot in the majors which seems to overlap with a lot of ideas from NLP. So a lot of the times people, rem uh, what do we say, T-O-Rex? done very well to learn new skills for the mind. Thank you, Tio. Um, so yeah, look, here's the thing. I think this book, The Magus, I think it's, my suspicion is, weaving a few things together, that it's actually quite an influence on NLP. Certainly, I'm guessing it's a fair influence on John Grinder. And it wouldn't surprise me, because what actually happens within the book is this person's reality gets unpeeled. He's pulled into one version of reality, reveals it to be a falsehood, at which point another version of reality pops up to include the original version of reality. So it outframes it in NLP language. There is an outframing, a broader frame that encompasses the original frame. And then when that one collapses, there's a broader frame that encompasses the original frame. Now this is something that I kind of do an analog of when I'm doing the hypnosis without trance stuff, particularly the no-fail stuff. My point in doing hypnosis is I never like to reveal where it's going. Now in the book, The Magus, nobody knows where the game is going. The game is an emergent engagement, okay? This uh, game ends up being referred to at the end of the book as the God game. That's as much of a spoiler as I want to give away uh, that he's got pulled into this God game. Now the game, the outcome is unspecified. What occurs, the differences, the changes, the creations that emerge from it, they are purely emergent from the maneuvers. And there is a co-creation between the players of the game. So it's uh, part 
planned but part improvised as well. They kind of know where they're going, but they're always ready to roll over and fold and create something new with what happens. Now, this is a huge thing. I suspect it's, uh, it has made its way, it's a virus that's made its way into the psychology of NLP, so to speak. It's probably ended up in my own psychology, which is why the no-fail approach that I use has such an analog to what's going on in the God game in the book, The Major, so metaphorically speaking. But one of the things, so what I mean by that is like as soon as something starts to crumble or fold, you're in charge of the frames. So you create a new frame around it. You can outframe it entirely. So uh, just wanted to tell you that you are a really great hypnotist without trance, Sabine. Thank you very much. I will take that and I will wear that. Um, yes, so. So I think that there's an analog in what's going on in the GOG game, and certainly my approach to hypnosis, if you're familiar with the no-fail protocol, even though it's quite old now, uh, I was already heading in that direction back then, and I've evolved it more in that way since. What I think that I've got from the Magus is a sort of clarity that I didn't have before about that that, that is what I'm doing, but also I've got a lot of stuff cooking in my mind about what might be possible in terms of, instead of sitting everything within a huge hypnosis frame and then being able to alter and modify and render that frame in different ways, which is typically what I do when I'm doing hypnosis and creating with unpredictable um, foldings, is what if I outframe hypnosis entirely, but then reframe hypnosis? Because that's one of the things. In the, in the book, I don't know if that froze there. One of the things in the book is one of, is one of the early realities that the protagonist is pulled into uh, and then is broken then starts to look like it was the real reality in the end. So it's like, it's not just a chunking up through logical levels and outframing and an outframing and an outframing to perpetually bigger frames. A kind of weird, strange loop comes in. Anyway, suffice it to say, the whole book is a massive head job. And uh, I love things that are a massive head job. I want to just offer some critiques, some criticisms of the Magus uh, here. I thought the book, on the whole was incredibly entertaining. I loved what it did and I thought that it was an incredible vehicle. Pro profoundly powerful vehicle. It could have been a profoundly powerful vehicle for something really interesting, but my feeling is that it was an empty vehicle, ultimately, in the end. I think on a structural level it was very interesting. I'm gonna dip that out again. Structural level it was very interesting, but on a deeper level, um, I think it lacked content. I think the author, did not implicitly have a philosophy that he was coming from. I think he's just kind of playing with heads in a Loki-esque way, rather than really using it as a vehicle for any kind of profound philosophy, even though it is intimated that it is a vehicle for profound philosophy. All right, so my phone is about to die. This live stream has eaten up uh, all the energy inside of it. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me on this live stream. Uh, it's a bit kind of disorganized. It's the first time I've tried multitasking like this, uh, walking, talking. And uh, Clark says, you're always thought provoking as always. So thank you very much, Clark. If I've provoked some thoughts, that's a good thing. If you've got any questions about the majors, I might make a more coherent video on this at some point. But if you have any questions about this that you want to ask, please make use of the comment section. Please do subscribe if you're new here. If you've come here because you're interested in the majors, you want to know more about hypnosis, NLP, you can hit that subscribe and uh, the conversation is always going to continue. So take care.